Well, imagine um, going into Elmira, downtown Elmira somewhere, going to a restaurant for takeout, right? Just for takeout. And um, you bump into someone that you know, or uh, maybe a neighbor or a friend or some sort of connection. And you start talking about the usual stuff, right? You start talking about the weather and you start talking about pandemic and school starting, all those regular things. And then somehow along the way, you get to talking about church. You don't even know how you got there. You know, you just were talking about that. And they find out that you are going to this new church plant called Citizens Church. Um, going through their head, if, you know, if they're, uh, if they're not even a Christian, they might be thinking, man, why do you even still believe in God? <laughs> why do you still go to church? They might not ask you that, but they might be thinking that in their head. Um, if they're a Christian, they might be thinking, um, why are you planting another church in a town that has churches already? And um, I'm not sure what your answer would be. But part of the reason behind this series that we're doing called We Are Citizens is we are going to be looking at why are we doing what we're doing? Like, why are we sitting here in the basement of Trinity United? You might be asking yourself that this morning. Um, you know, doing a church plant here in Elmira. And um, every uh, church, even every individual has like a, a vision, has like a purpose for why they are doing what they're doing. Um, you might not be able to articulate it, you know, or be like, you say it in a line or write it down somewhere, but you have purpose and reason for doing and for being who you are and doing what you're doing. If you didn't, you'd probably uh, be really depressed. Um, you'd be wondering what's the what's tomorrow going to hold, you know, and, and uh, it would maybe spin you down in a circle that is not in a good place. And so we as a church also, we have a vision for existing. And if this might sound familiar a little bit for you, the, the vision that we have as a church. Uh, we've got it on our website, and we've talked about it at different meetings early on. It was this, it's that we exist to see people come to know and be changed by Jesus, and we do this through simple gospel-centered worship, community, and by making disciples who pursue mission in Elmira. And so this is what we believe the mission of Citizens Church to be, um, a mission statement can just simply be that though, right? It can be words on a screen or, or if you're fancy enough, you can paint it on a wall. We can't do that here because we don't own this building, so we couldn't. Uh, we could put it on the chalkboard maybe, but we couldn't leave it here. But they are simply words unless you actually do what you say it is. And so one of the things that helps you actually do your vision statement is values, right? They're things that you can... They're almost like guardrails. They help you go in the same direction and they help give you focus to what you're doing. And so we as a church also have four values that we'll kind of hang on to. And, and Zach put them in images for us that makes it a little bit easier for us to remember them. But basically the four values that we have is at the top here is gospel liv living. Um, one family is kind of circle people together. Simple practices. And in the top one, these um, communication bubbles are disciple making. Okay, and those are the four things that we regularly want to remind ourselves of. These are important things that when we practice them, they actually help us to accomplish our vision. And so today we're going to look at the top right where we're talking about disciple making. Okay, and so at Citizens, and uh, this isn't unique to the church at large. This, these should be things that are present in churches all over the world. But at Citizens, we want to be disciples. So we want to firstly people that are disciples of Jesus Christ, but we're disciples who are making disciples. And then through that process of disciple making, we, we're praying to, to the goal that we are actually a church then that plants churches. Right? So as this multiplication happens of disciples making disciples in our midst, that will spill over into churches planting other churches. So if you have a Bible this morning with you, or if you have your phone, we're going to look at Mark chapter 1. And it's interesting that the beginning of Jesus' ministry begins with Jesus talking about discipleship and calling people to make disciples. 
And then the end of Jesus' ministry is also a call to disciples. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, and then in a little bit we're going to flip one page back and we're going to look at Matthew 28. So we see the beginning and the end of Christ's ministry is all focused on making disciples. So in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 14 and 15, we see here what Christ begins his ministry by saying. He says this, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, This time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus comes on the scene, begins his ministry by saying, what you've been waiting for, and, and his primary audience is the Jews, right? So this is the people that he's talking to. He goes out and he says, what you've been waiting for, all your hopes, everything that you have been hoping for in life is actually come to its totality through me, Jesus. When Jesus comes on the scene, he says, and, and these are amazing claims that he's making. He's saying the ultimate reality, what Jer was just talking about, ultimate reality that we look for in other things. Jesus is saying here, the ultimate reality that you've been waiting for, the, the period of time that you've been hoping would come, the kingdom of God actually arriving is here. And it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus wasn't the first and the last to make that claim that he was the Messiah. There would be others that would make that claim, but he would use the rest of his ministry years and the miracles and the teaching and the healings to show people that it was true. It was true that he was ultimate reality. And so as disciples, our calling, our first calling is to actually experience and know Jesus as ultimate reality, not money. Not the things, not the accomplishments in life, but everything is actually found in Christ. And then what Jesus calls them to, you know, in this bold statement of him being the totality of what they've been expecting. Um, he says, your calling then is to repent. And repentance um, used to be a word that had kind of some like negative baggage with it. Maybe it still does. But repentance just means turning around, right? It just means that essentially we as people are going in the wrong direction. And so discipleship is a lifelong journey of turning around, which is part of the thing that makes discipleship kind of hard because we are regularly humbled. We are regularly shown that we are going in the wrong direction. Isaiah 53, 6, I was thinking of this verse this morning. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Like we're all going in the wrong direction over and over and over again. And so Jesus' call is, I am ultimate reality. And your response then is, you're going to have to do a lot of turning around. There's going to be repentance that is regularly going to happen. So that's kind of his general proclamation. He's, it's, it's calls it here the, the gospel, right? It's, it's his good news. But then in verse 16, he gets even more specific when he begins to actually call some of the disciples. So verse 16 says this, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus called them to follow him to follow him. And they immediately did that. It says they left their nets and they followed him. And I don't know, that word nowadays, becoming a follower, can be a little bit pro problematic because, you know, if we think of Instagram or we think of Twitter or Facebook, you, you can become a follower of someone, right? Someone that you've never met, stars maybe that you're like, I'm their follower. You know, it's like you're almost their friend, but you're not really. You're never going to meet that person. You know, you're never going to get close to that this kind of following is not that. It's not just clicking follow someone. It actually means they are devoted to becoming and being like Jesus. They're going to learn from him. What does it mean to live? And so it's more than just being a fan of someone. It's actually being a follower. And so there's many people that, and I, I think we talked about this in Acts before, there's many people that um, would say that they love Jesus, 
They might even love his teachings. They just think he's like a great person. There's people from other religions that would think, man, Jesus, he's a great guy. But would they be considered a disciple or a follower? Probably if you ask them, they would probably even say no. There's even some Christians who would say that they are a follower or a disciple of Christ. And, and if we're honest, probably all of us to some degree would say we're a follower, but there might be certain aspects of our life that we won't totally give over. It's uh, recorded that in the Middle Ages when, um, you know, there's a lot of men that were um, coming to Christ and they would be baptized. And the way that they would be baptized was they would go down into the water in like a river or something. But in one hand, they would keep a sword in their hand and they would only take the water up to here. Right? So they would become baptized. They would go down, but they would leave that hand and that sword up out of water, essentially saying, I want to become a follower of Jesus. But if my calling is still to go and to kill and to plunder, then this hand is not Christ's. And many people, in, when they think about discipleship, they are disciples in that way. And probably, if I'm honest, there's aspects of my life where that's the same thing. I'm willing to become a disciple up until this point. Maybe it's, for you, it's taking Christ into your workplace. Or maybe it's, there's certain hurts or things that you've been hanging on to where you're like, I'll become, a def- I'll become a follower of Christ up until here. It will only go this far. And Jesus says here, follow me. And when he says that, that is all encompassing. He is all, he wants to be followed through all areas of life, not just like some of it. It means all areas of life. And that's why discipleship is a process, right? We are humans and this is a lifelong process to actually see that happen. And one that, um, you know, if you talk to people that are uh, much, much older than you, and that's, we all have people that are older than us and they're, they've been believers for a long time. It's, it's a process. It just takes a lifetime and it's never finished. So if it's a process, how do we actually do that? If Christ is ultimate reality, He is everything we have been longing, everything that we need and are waiting for. And if our calling is to fully follow him, how do we do that? Well, turn one page over in your Bible, or maybe it's a little harder if you're on a smartphone. Get back to Matthew chapter 28. And at the end of Jesus's ministry, after three years of being with the disciples, he's still talking about how to make disciples. And he's still giving that mission to the, to the followers that are with him at that point. And he says, this is how you do it. And starting in verse 16, it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he begins by saying, here is how you're going to do this. Here's how you're going to make disciples. Now, you can buy all kinds of books and there's all kinds of things. We're going to be going through Saturate, you know, learning about how to make disciples. Jesus makes it super simple, okay? He says, you're going to baptize people and you're going to teach people. These are the two main things that you're going to be doing. You're going to be baptizing people and teaching people. And so this baptizing is all coming back to us as believers. We are storytellers, Now, the the story that we tell is a true story, okay? It's not a fictional story. It is a true story that we tell, but we are storytellers. We are, another way of saying it is maybe like heralds, you know? Like we are the ones who go out and tell this message just like Jesus did. We are called to be people that bring the, the good news. And so, you know, if you're a business and you want to be successful, you probably need like a marketing strategy. You need to create some, maybe some Twitter buzz or something, right? You want it to get really um, out there that you have this product. Um, if you are starting a religion, you might need a temple, you know, this beautiful place that people go to. If you are uh, part of a political movement, you need to be, you know, this 
leader that is, looks great on TV or you need to have this movement behind you. Jesus designed his mission to be one person at a time, person to person. A life changed by you and I, regular people, telling stories and, and telling the story of Jesus Christ, the greatest story that there ever is. And it's something that, I don't know if, if, if you struggle with believing this or not, but it's, it is still a story that captivates people. Right? The world might tell us that it's a old, it's out of date, nobody's believing that anymore. It is still a story that is being told and the church is growing around the world. And there's still opportunity for us right here in Elmira to retell that story because through whether it's choices or through people's circumstances, they don't fully understand this idea of Jesus being ultimate reality. And um, I read this week about a a story of a man named Douglas Hyde who actually worked for, he was an editor for the Daily Worker during World War II, which is a communist newspaper. Okay, this was in England. He was a part of the communist movement. And so he was the editor for this magazine trying to get this movement going. And eventually, at some point during World War II, he was disillusioned and he actually turned to Christ and started attending like Catholic church. And so that was kind of his persuasion. And as he got into that, he discovered that Christians were like so defeatist. Like they didn't think that this message would captivate people anymore. And so he wrote this. He said, coming straight as it were from one world to another, it astounded me that there should be people with such numbers at their disposal, with the truth on their side, going around, weighed down by the thought that they were a small, beleaguered minority carrying some sort of impossible fight against a big majority. Basically, his, his, what he was shocked by and what he wanted people to understand was that if this is the truth, if Christ is reality, and if we have believers all over the world, then this is not an impossibility. This is actually possible. This is not like the communist movement where you get disillusioned and it just kind of falls apart. He was like, here we have truth. Let's move forward with it with boldness. And this is what we're called to. We are called to step forward. And, and the baptism that we're talking about happens through us being heralds, being tellers of the greatest story that is out there. So there's baptism, but the other side is teaching. And, and baptism and becoming a believer is something that it can happen quickly, right? I could preach a sermon or you could talk to someone and their eyes could be opened and they're like, I believe. Boom, happens. They become a believer. They could be baptized right on the spot or they could be baptized on another Sunday. Boom, it happens. This part, this teaching that he says at the beginning of verse 20 is something that is slower, something that takes time. It's like planting a tree, right? I don't know if you've ever done that before. I remember when I was a kid, one time we had like a, in school, we went to this tree tree farm. I don't know if they call it a tree farm. And then we came home with this little sapling. It was about this big. That little sapling, I put it in the ground. It was living. It was alive. This was in Manitoba. I don't know if that sapling is still alive anymore, but it's, it'd be a lot bigger now because that was 20, 25, 30 years ago, right? So you put this thing in that's alive, but to see it grow, to see it flourish, if it's a fruit tree, it's going to take years and years of helping it along or nature is just going to kind of guide it along and take care of it and it's going to grow. This takes time. And so as disciples, this aspect of teaching is something that takes time. And so learning to do anything takes time. Learning to do something great takes a lot of time. I don't know if you've ever heard of like um, professional sports stars. Um, they take like 10, 12 hours a day uh, to do their craft, right? Whether it's hockey or anything. Well, I read this week that um, Bruce Lee, anybody heard of Bruce Lee before, right? Martial arts. Okay, so this is way back in the 60s and 70s. So Bruce Lee, probably regarded as the greatest martial arts expert they said that he practiced 18 hours a day. And every day he made sure that he did at least 500 kicks and 2,000 punches. I don't, he kept count, okay? Or somebody did. Maybe his assistant did. But Bruce Lee was a master, right? Now, the difference between 
mastering something and being a disciple is that disciples are actually, it's not, we're not trying to become professional master Christians, right? We're not just trying to be like, I'm the best at being a Christian. Discipleship is actually about transformation. Remember we talked about, it's about turning around. It's a lifetime of turning around. And so discipleship is slowly over years and years, regularly turning around. It's, it's more a matter of being mastered by Christ than mastering Christ. But it's still something that takes much, much time. And so there are some basic practices that we do to become disciples. And probably many of you have done these things. And, and in, in David Mathis's book called Habits of Grace, he talks about three of them. So I'm, I'm going to lump the first two together. Well, so there's only two more points, okay? So the first one is hearing from and talking to God. Okay, so as a disciple, this is key. This is part of our regular practices. It is hearing from and talking to God, hearing from God through his word. We, I mean, we are blessed in Canada to have um, Bibles that we can buy. We can buy it really cheaply. We could probably walk up to any church and get a Bible for free. We can download the Bible app so we can access God's word at any time, literally, and we can talk to God at any time. And yet, it's easy to not do that. It is easy to find other things to do. It is not difficult to become busy with our own stuff. And and what ends up happening, this pesky thing that ends up happening, is we become territorial almost. Okay? So, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. You're in the shopping mall. You're not in that. You're just in the parking lot. That's the first step. And you find someone... You know, this is a really busy time. You find someone that is about to get out and they're just getting into their car and so you're waiting. Blinkers on, you're waiting. Does it not seem like they take forever to get out, right? And you know what? They've actually done studies on this and people do take longer. So if you are going into your car and you see that someone is waiting for you, for some reason, consciously or unconsciously, you take longer. That's the time where you straighten your mirror, You check your glove compartment, you do something. And part of the reason they've discovered is this is your space and you are going to own that space as long as you can. And they've studied this, that if the person honks their horn, you will take four times longer. All right. And the same thing happens in a restaurant. So if you are in a restaurant and it's really busy and there's a lineup, you take longer than if there's no lineup at all. Go figure. We love our space, right? We love our, it's our time. It's my parking space. It's my table. There's so many things that we can say no to or yes to. And discipleship, hearing from God and talking to God, is this process of learning to say yes to God. Learning to say yes to God. And discipleship is this lifelong process of doing that. One of the benefits of COVID-19 or one of the blessings that's come is it's It said no for us to many things, right? It forced us to say no to things because nothing was going on. But it didn't necessarily force us to say yes to other things. So there was many opportunities that we couldn't do. There's lots of no's. But still as disciples, we were the ones who needed to say yes. And so I don't know how that went for you. What they're discovering, I think, in... in, around the world is that a lot of people are saying yes to Twitter or to YouTube or to Netflix. Um, And so there's conspiracy theories that are being born and there are people that are following all kinds of stuff. They're, They're not being as careful with their no's and their yeses all the time. And so as believers, that, man, that is part of the thing that we are learning is how to say yes to hearing from God and talking to to God. So do you have a plan for prayer, for reading, for reflection? Is that built into your day or is it built into your week? This is again probably a lifelong process. So there's hearing from God and talking to God. Lastly here there is belonging to the body of Christ. Okay? Belonging to the body of Christ. God has designed that we make disciples in community. We do this together. And so this teaching that Jesus is talking about is primarily done 
together. And let me throw up uh, all these scriptures here. You can see there's a number of different scriptures, different ways that it actually shows up in scripture. So Titus 2, 3 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. So you see this relationship of older women to younger women. A similar thing here in 2 Timothy 2, 2, where Paul says, What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this is Paul speaking to Timothy, right? Similar relationship, older men to younger men. Then we see here Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So here is a clear calling for dads in the home to be active participants in discipleship and you know there's a few of us dads here that still have kids at home you know we are called to lead the way to be participants it it does tell us that we're pretty good at making our kids angry at times so we got that one down pat all right but now it is growing to bring discipleship into the home and and listen it doesn't mean that we end up being the masters at everything it doesn't end up meaning that we are the the greatest theologians in the home. Um, I mean, I think the greatest joy that we would have is, is a wife who knows the word of God, right? That this is a partnership together. And it also doesn't mean that we are responsible for the salvation of our kids. That is something that God is doing in their hearts. But the calling is clear. We are active participants in discipleship in the home. It also says here in Ephesians 3.13, But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's a calling for all of us to be involved in discipleship, whether we are single, married, kids at home, kids gone, everybody is called. And this, Hebrews, is in the context of a relationship, right? So this is why we're doing missional families even, because we want relationship to exist. And then, 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So each of us as believers is given gifts that we are meant to serve and to function together for our co-discipleship you know, in one body. And so the, the primary places where this happens is the home and the local church. Right, the home and the local church, because this is these are the places where there is commitment. Now, definitely in the family, there is commitment. You know, your kids won't leave till you're hoping 18, right? Maybe around that time, or you know, they're going to go at that point. But generally, you are committed to your children and the local church as well. Even though we live in a world where you can you can church hop and you can come and go, you know, we are building a church here that has commitment, that has um, together this one family idea so that we are committed to each other to see this process of discipleship happen. And so a good word that is used for church is this word koinonia. And you know, there's a church, right, called koinonia. And that word means fellowship. And it's not just, you know, having coffee together. It is actually this idea of partnership. That's what that word means, koinonia, partnership, committed together to one purpose or one mission. And and that's the reason why, you know, J.R. Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, his first book is called The Fellowship of the Ring, right? This idea of fellowship. They are committed to one goal together. The world is is doom and gloom and the dark side is coming. And so Frodo and Aragon and all these characters are together committed. They're a, a fellowship for the ring. And so this is the idea behind believers together is this concept of fellowship. We are working together. And so whether it is you individually um, telling the story, baptizing, being a disciple yourself, or we collectively together belonging to each other, the calling is to make disciples. So we are Citizens Church, and we are here to make disciples. And um, we still get, uh, we have 
uh, CAA membership. And so we still get the CAA magazine. Okay. And it's, uh, there's a lot of pictures in there of people, you know, in the twilight years, they are usually on like boats or on, on a train or something. And they're like looking back. Right. And I think the picture is meant to give you this idea of like, Hey, we've lived our life and we've saved everything up. And now this is, we're looking back on life. And, and I think it's actually good to reflect on life, not just in retirement, but regularly, if we would look back at our lives, what is the thing that we would see that we have left behind? Is it just the accomplishments that we have? Is it just the money that we've made? Or is it actually the lives that we have changed? And so my hope is that Citizens Church looks back regularly and we look back and we see, wow, this is what God has done through this life. Wow, this is what God has done in this family. Wow, this is what God has done in our midst collectively. And so our calling to make disciples is one that we won't glory in as a, as a church. We'll glory in because it's a work that God has done through us in our midst. So let's pray. God, we thank you for the vision of making disciples. And Lord, this is not our idea. This is uh, straight from uh, Christ and his ministry at the beginning, throughout, to the end, and still to us today. So, Lord, would you just help us as a church to lean on you, to trust in you um, as we make disciples. And, uh, Lord, we pray that all these things would be to your glory. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.